Would you join me in prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the privilege that we can meet in this sanctuary at this time. Lord, I thank you that you're here. You promised us where two would be gathered, two or three in your name. Lord, that's exactly what we've done. We, we've, met, we've met the quotient, and Lord God, we have the number and then some. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that all of us would be aware of your presence. We're going to look to your word right now, Lord God, and I pray for an anointing upon my voice. It's weak, but your word is strong. I pray, Lord God, you'd give us ears to hear and hearts to receive, and I pray that our lives would be encouraged and changed by the word today, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My life, God's goodness. As they said back in the day, and I hope they're still saying today, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. You all know what we're talking about. When we slept past the alarm and the kids missed the bus to school, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good, right? When I missed my hair appointment and I've got to wait a month for those hair extensions, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Ha <laughs> ha. When family is resisting me and friends are scarce, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. When my doctor or my lawyer or my banker tells me I, they have bad news for me, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Now, we may think so, depending on what kind of season we are in, in life, but God's goodness is not measured by the current condition of your life. God remains good. His character is good. And if you and I will just hang in there tough with God, His goodness will manifest over and over and over again in our lives. You see, church, God can't help himself. He's good. I'd like to read from the Psalms this morning, specifically Psalm 27, and I want to build on that thought, my life, God's goodness, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, teach me how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting for me. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I've never done. With every breath they threaten me with violence. Yet I am confident, and I love that word confident, yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. In the words of the great 1970s, Musical theologians, I can't live if living is without you. <laughs> there's a certain group that knows exactly. And there's another group like, huh? Psalm 2711, we started with it, it says, teach me how to live. O oh God, lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting for me. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I've never done. With every breath they threaten me with violence. Teach me how to live, O oh Lord. If I'm not mistaken, David wrote this psalm, hiding in a cave from Saul. He was already anointed to be the next king, but he wasn't king yet. Saul was still on the throne, and Saul wasn't going to give up his throne for anyone. Saul tried to take David's life on several occasions. And here he is in a cave writing to remind himself, saying, teach me how to live, O Lord. If there's one thing that God truly wants us to learn in this life, if it could be boiled down to one idea, one concept, it would be God wants us to live completely dependent upon Him. 
trusting him, following him, learning of him, becoming like him. Now, I know what we are as people. We're pretty confident in ourselves. We're pretty uh, uh, sure of our abilities. Uh, You know, how many times have we said, I got this, I can handle this, I can do this myself? And there's no doubt that God has given us intellect and the capability to improve and to learn and to grow in wisdom. And 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 I, I feel like as I've gotten older, I've gotten wiser, but what wisdom has taught me is that and even more at this point than ever, I need the Lord to teach me how to live. Ever since Jesus came into our lives, ever since the Holy Spirit was given, He's been trying to teach us that there is a lifestyle, an approach to living that is different than the one we learned in this world. A lifestyle with values and standards and promises that are higher than the world's. Teach me how to live, O Lord, that I might live according to your values, that I might live by your standards, and that I might live in your promises. There's a life in Jesus that transfers our hope and our trust from people who aren't always trustworthy, even from ourselves, and places it completely on God himself. It's a lifestyle of faith. It's learning daily to trust in and rest in the Lord, a life that is pleasing to the Lord in all things. Psalm 24, verses 4 through 5 says, Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me, uh, for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope In you, we don't have to live our lives guessing. We don't have to live our lives hoping that we are making the right decisions. If we are willing to be teachable, some of us know-it-alls need to learn how to be taught. If we're willing to be teachable, the Holy Spirit will teach us life in Christ. And it permeates every arena of your life, everything that makes up your life, relationships, occupation, education, finances, even conflict and confrontation, making life goals, achieving life goals. If we will learn life in Christ, if we will be teachable, he'll be in the middle of all these things. And most of all, he will teach us to walk in truth, to separate to be separate from the world, dead to sin, and alive to God. You see, sin is only a problem to the one caught in it. But to those who are under the blood of Jesus, sin shall no longer have any dominion over you. To walk in his truth. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 17, it's Jesus praying, and he said, I've given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. I love that. I know it's the only thing we've ever known. We were born into this human existence We've lived on this world, but when we came to Jesus, we became citizens of a different country, of a different kingdom, and we don't belong to this world any more than Jesus does. And he goes on to say, make them holy, or the King James says, sanctify them by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. It's a sanctified life. Teach me, Lord, how to live a sanctified life. Which means that Jesus isn't just part of our lives, that Jesus isn't just high on the priority list, but that our lives are set apart for Jesus. So that it's evident to everyone that we do not belong to this world any more than Jesus does. Teach me how to live O Lord God, so that I can live a life that declares by faith and by experience that he's good, real good. 
By the way, I'm quoting my pastor, Pastor Hess, and you can tell him I did so next week. Verse 13 in Psalm 27 says, Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to know the goodness of God. You don't have to wait until your bodies are transformed into an eternal body in order to see the goodness of God. The fact that you woke up this morning with breath in your lungs and a heartbeat is the, 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 the demonstration of the goodness of God in your life. Over and over and over again, the goodness of God has been evident in our life. Am I talking to the right crowd? Do I know people here? You're the one, you know the goodness of God, right? I'm confident that I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Literally, that we will see the superlative example of what is good and kind and gracious. See, it isn't that Jesus is just high on the scale. He's the bar by which all goodness is measured. No one is capable of goodness in greater measure than God. And we can live in the confidence that the Lord's goodness will be made evident in our lives again and again and again. I love what he told Moses in the Old Testament when he was up on Mount Sinai in Exodus 33. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you, for I will show mercy to anyone I choose. And I will show compassion to anyone I choose. The beautiful truth about this is, child of God, you and I are the ones he chose to show mercy and compassion to. His goodness is at work in us through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, that mercifully and compassionately washed us and cleansed us of our sins. I mean, honestly, if, he's never do, if he never does another thing, he's made us eternally children of God. But you see, in his goodness, it's just going to overflow more and more and more. His goodness is passing before us even when we're struggling with our greatest battles. His goodness is passing before us even when we're knocked down in our most humiliating defeat even as we are pressed by people, conditions, events, occurrences, even devils that want to crush us, rip us apart, take us out. You see, the one thing that I've realized, and I bet you have too, is that even since Jesus came into your life, it hasn't made you exempt from hard times. Romans chapter 8 says all things work together for good. Now it doesn't say all things are good. It says all things work together for good. It doesn't say every day is pleasant. It doesn't say life will be without pain or struggle or that life will always be safe. But it does say whatever the things may be in your life. We all got things, don't we? God is working it out for your good. There's something God is doing with it. He's throwing it into his heavenly mixing bowl so he can bake you a cake of his goodness. Now you can't quote that in King James, but you got the idea. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purposes. Psalm 23 and 6, and I love this. I love the 23rd Psalm, but I love what it says in verse 6. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Your goodness and unfailing love, your goodness and mercy, according to the King James, will follow me, pursue me all the days of my life. It isn't just that it will be somewhere behind you as you journey through life. The big picture here, the concept is more grand than it even sounds. Literally, the psalmist is saying, God's goodness doesn't just stay behind you on your heels somewhere back there all the days of your life, but it pursues you until it overtakes you. 
In other words, the goodness of God is literally hunting you down. Which, if that's the case, maybe we ought to stop running. Maybe we ought to slow down in our tracks, make it easy for the goodness of God to find its way in our lives. That he will literally, that the the very thought from the original language is that the goodness and the mercy of God will hunt you down until it overtakes you. God, overtake me. Let your goodness overtake my life. Let me absolutely be consumed in your goodness. Goodness isn't just what God chooses to be. You know, it isn't that God just says, well, I'm in a mood today to be good. He can't help himself. It's his nature. It's easy for us to see it differently, to see goodness as a conditional thing because in our human experience, goodness is conditional on the choice of the people involved. We can think because people can turn it off and on, God must do the same. And that when we're weary and when we're tired and life isn't going well and we're fighting a battle and we're, and we're staining our pillow with our tears at night and all of those things that are realities in our life, it must be the evidence that God has chosen not to be good to me for this season. God is incapable of not being good. Because he's not like men. We, we can't compare God to people. We can't compare his character to the character of people. We can't compare his desire and his longing to the desire and the longing of people. God is incapable of not being good. And through us in every season of our life, we'll put his goodness on display for us and through us. Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and 9, you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Oh, we've been pretty good at showing others our complaint because some way, somehow along the way, we've failed to see the goodness of God. But you need to understand the goodness of God is at work in all situations. And I know you want the end result. I like end result too. I'm not a project person. I'm a finished project person. That's just my temperament. But I also know I'm a project that God is working on. That, that, that he's got work to do on me still. And sometimes when I'm in the middle of something that's hot and heated and and uncomfortable, and and God is dealing with things in my life that I wish he would leave alone? Oh, that's too real for Sunday morning, right? You know, when God wakes you up at two something in the morning and you can't get back to sleep because he's talking to you about something in your life, and you just say, God, I wish you'd just let me sleep. It's the goodness of God at work. Because that same verse that says he's working all things together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose to conform us to the image of his son. To make us like Jesus. To reflect Jesus. All the goodness of God is at work in our lives to make us more and more and more like our king. More and more and more like our Redeemer. That's the desire of, oh, teach me how to live, Lord God, so that your goodness can have access to my life. As a result, Peter says, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. We are called out to show the goodness of God. I love those people when you know they're suffering and struggling with life, but the only thing they'll ever do is praise the Lord. I I love those. They're they're the easiest people to be around. Because, you you know, you call them up because you're going to encourage them and comfort them because they've been going through it, and they encourage and comfort you. Because they just got this thing in them that they know God is good even when they're crying, even when their heart is broken. God is good. 
and they show others the goodness of God because they know in spite of the circumstance, their status with God hasn't changed. Who they are in the Lord, you still are. On your worst day, you still are who God says you are. And they're able in the midst of their difficulty to show others the goodness of God. Now I'm going to move on because I know your tummies are grumbling. But there's one other thing. And as long as I've been quoting others this morning, let me quote the Heinz ketchup commercial and say, anticipation is making me wait. Y'all are probably wondering what I did all week to get this stuff. Psalm 27 and 14, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous, yes, wait patiently for the Lord. This is the key when you feel stressed, pressed, depressed, and oppressed, to wait patiently for the Lord. When you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, wait patiently for the Lord. When life feels ridiculous, that word's come to my mind a lot lately. This is ridiculous. People who are supposed to understand don't. Wait patiently for the Lord. You don't have to retaliate. You don't have to take action. You don't have to vindicate yourself. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to make them see what they aren't willing to see. You don't have to run away or hide in a cave. All you have to do is wait patiently for the Lord. I know, I know, you know, When somebody believes something about you that isn't true, when they're saying things about you that is the furthest from the truth, you want to rise up and say, that's not true. Don't tell people what's not true. When stuff is happening in your life that's out of control and and you feel like, man, I've got to step in. I've got to take action. I've got to do something about it. I don't know about you, but I usually make a worse mess of it. When the instruction is, when David found out himself, wait patiently for the Lord. In fact, in one verse, he said it twice. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Which, by the way, may require the most courage of of all because they may keep on talking about you. And the situation might not change in your time frame. And it takes a lot of courage to let go and let God. But you see, why should we pick up a fight when God's already won the fight? Why do we have to pick up stones and sling them when the cross has already disarmed principalities and powers? When the enemy has already been rendered helpless? Oh, he can be noisy. And he can do a lot of deceiving and accusing, but he got nothing to shoot at you. Because the Bible says that at the cross, he disarmed principalities and powers. And he made them an open show, a public spectacle. The Bible says the weapons may form, but they're not going to prosper. He's got no ammunition. So why pick a fight with anyone or anything when God's already won the victory? I know it's hard because you want to speak up for yourself or you want to defend people that you love or you want to step in and make the rights wrong. I know that there's that human equation that steps up and that says, I can't allow this. You don't have to. Wait patiently for the Lord. Why roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty when God's got his sleeves rolled up for you? Wait patiently for the Lord. I mean, if there was anybody that needed to be reminded, it was David because he knew that Samuel anointed him to be king in Israel. And the current king didn't like it a bit and tried to kill him already. And there he was hiding in a cave, and he said, all right, 
let's just hide here a while. Let's just wait on the Lord. Now, the cool thing is we don't have to go into a cave. We just need to go underneath the wings of God. He said he would hide us in his pavilion from the strife of tongues. He's our hiding place. He's our refuge, our strong tower. Waiting on the Lord may take, require the most courage of it all, of all because it takes a brave individual to rest in the Lord when life around you is a hurricane of threats, accusation, lies, and out-of-control conditions. And yet, the Bible says, wait patiently on the Lord. The same psalmist who said he would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living in the very next sentence said, wait patiently on the Lord. Don't you love the sound of that? Wait patiently. Yeah, right, you're lying to me. None of you want to wait patiently. Who wants to wait? Pa- Who wants to wait two minutes for the car in the front of you in line to get out of the way so you can get your bag? What is taking so long up there? Oh, that just might be me. I'm sorry. Waiting would not usually be our first option, even when we're enjoying our best days, let alone when you're under attack or pressured or anxious because life is threatening. But there's a benefit to waiting. There's a blessing to the waiting. Isaiah prophesied, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. It didn't say those who took up running for the Lord or picked up their weapons for the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Waiting patiently on the Lord will bring about the change that you need brought to your life. Psalm 40 verses 1 through 3 said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me. God doesn't ignore you. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, established my steps, put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. I know we like to help God along. And I know sometimes we think we need to inform God because we think he's missing some information. But we are going to need to trust that God knows what he's doing and whether you see it in an instant or not, he's doing it. It's going to take you leaning into where you know your strength truly comes from. Paul wrote it in Ephesians 6 and 10. He said, be strong in the Lord. He didn't say be strong in your personality, be strong in your family name, be strong in your charisma or your gifts or your talents. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen, devil doesn't know what to do with a child of God fully armored waiting on God. He got nothing for you. God is true to his word. God is faithful to his children. God is good when the sun is out as well as when the night is closing in. God is good when you're full. God is good when you're drained and empty. You've already testified that you've seen the goodness of the Lord in your life. You're going to see it again. It's evident even in the middle of the stuff that you wish would just go away. Be strong. Be very courageous. Be patient. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach you. Be teachable. Let him teach you how to live every kind of day. I know that seems like there's a certain way that we can live on Sunday, and then there's another way to live on Monday. Let him teach you how to live every day. You won't be disappointed because God is good to you all the time, and all the time God is good to you. It's not just some, 
I mean, I know they made a catchphrase of it, and it's a slogan, and people like to say it, but it's not just some silly churchism. It's the truth. God is good at all times. And he's worthy of my trust. He's worthy of my love. He's worthy that I should live in his truth. My life, God's goodness. Stand up with me this morning. It's your word, Lord. I read scripture to you in the hearing of these wonderful people. And I pray, Lord God, that they be encouraged. I know the human condition enough, and I know specifically in a few of their lives that they've been going through it. Been a lot of heartache and a lot of things to, that makes us wary and nervous. But God, this morning we're waiting on you. I pray, Lord God, that you will give them the courage, Lord God, to just wait. Where maybe once we would have spoke up to defend ourselves, that we would instead just retreat into your presence and trust you. Lord God, I pray that you'll give us all a teachable spirit. I pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you'll lead us on. Lord, making us aware of your goodness in all things. Lord, we say it's our life, but it's the life you've granted to us. I pray, Lord God, that my life would be a demonstration of your goodness in all things. Encourage again, I ask your sons and daughters. Lord, if, if someone's in the house today, and they're not living in relationship with you. I pray, Lord God, that you work in their heart. Show them how much that you love them. The gospel is not a message of condemnation. It's a message of love and redemption. And I pray that you'll show them, Lord God, that no matter how far they think they've gone, that your hand is extended out, that the bridge has been built by the cross, that the way to God is open. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that there's somebody here that doesn't know you, that they would simply take that step and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sin. Become the Lord of my life. Live in me. I will learn of you. I will grow in you, and I will walk with you. Teach me your ways. Teach me how to live, O oh Lord. I pray, Lord God, that they would realize, maybe they've never heard before, let me say it to them for the first time, that he who knew no sin was made to be sin, Jesus, for us that we might become the righteousness of God. I'm so grateful this morning, Lord God, that it's your righteousness in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that, that somebody this morning would make that step in their life. And if you do pray something like that or would like further counseling in that regard, uh, come see us afterwards. Pastor Bruce will be nearby. We have a book we'll give you called Your New Life. It just talks about what it is to, to step into relationship with Jesus and what life looks like from that point on and, and what you can expect and what to do to grow in that relationship. We're all about helping you grow in Jesus. But it was my primary desire to come and speak to the house of God today and to encourage your hearts. You will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. His word is true and he's faithful to it. 